Um, the poems are, uh, first of all, the only thing I know much about is the uh, country. So all the poems are about that. And I'll probably try to uh, introduce the poem shortly with maybe a short description of what I'm trying to get at, but <coughs> not much. Uh, so I'm just going to start. This is, this is called, Did I Say This Before? Once in autumn, I saw poplar leaves blast straight out from the treetop and flutter through cold sunshine. They even made a sound, some chatter they had learned from the birds. Meanwhile, a lone monarch butterfly flew stiffly around and landed on a dry corn tassel where it hung with tiny feet as the corn stalk shivered in the wind. Left behind by its nomad tribe, what errand was it on? Who had sent him, wings thin as gold foil, to be placed carefully on a page of the illuminated manuscript of Earth? And <clears throat> I'm going to start with some, some of the older poems. Uh, this is called Home Place, and it's, uh, you probably know what's happened in the country in the last 50 years. A lot of the farms have disappeared. The old house went down the basement stairs and didn't come back up. <laughs> the people, the cows, the sheep, the pigs and the chickens have disappeared through a great hole in the landscape. And this is a short poem. It's the first poem that I, that I kept way back in the 60s, I guess. And uh, it's called Winter Twilight. It's winter now and almost night. The grass of the earth is dead. My window sill has been put on crooked so that I am chilled by air, dark and cold. Outside I can see no one, and the last of the sunlight is being hunted down by something frozen. Well, <clears throat> this is a, there's a lake about 20, 30 miles east of wh where I grew up. And where I grew up was a prairie, and we, we didn't have much for lakes, you know, a prairie lake once in a while. And we had a pretty good river running through called the Pont de Terre, which was named by some French trappers, I assume. But um, this uh, Lake Minnewaska is uh, a really good uh, walleye lake, in case you're interested. It's called Lake Minnewaska is turning to slush. Tracks lead to shore past an old boat punched full of holes toward a cabin with kitchen lights already on. Everyone has gone inside. A gill net hangs from the garage wall dripping, monotonous as an all-night rain. Scaling the just caught <coughs> fish, darkness sticks to everything. Let's see. Um, this is about an owl, just called Cold in the Trees. The hoot of the owl is large enough to carry off a whole sheep. <laughs> <laughs> And I worked for the DNR for, for many years, the Department of Natural Resources in Minnesota, and then for about eight or nine years in South Dakota for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And every place I worked was remote and it was a target anyone around. Working in South Dakota, when I would leave in the morning to go to work someplace 100 miles away from the refuge, if I met three cars on the trip, I wondered where everyone was going. <laughs> 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 anyway, this is called Finding Horse Skulls on a Day that Smelled Like Flowers. At the place where I found the two white skulls, sunlight came through the aspen branches. Under one skull were large beetles with hard bodies, the other one I didn't move. Around them, new grass grew, making the scent of the earth visible. Where the sun touched the shining bone, it was warm, as though the horses were dreaming in the spring afternoon, with night still miles away. And this is called Crawling Out the Window, the prose poem in um, the Middle Continental Divide in the northwestern corner of Stevens County in western Minnesota. And it's the beginning of the Red River of the North. So everything goes to Hudson Bay. Uh, 
from the divide on the north side of the divide, and the rest goes down the Minnesota River to the Mississippi to the Gulf of Mexico. So it's called crawling out the window. When water starts to run, winds come to the sky, carrying parts of Canada, and the house is filled with the scent of dead grass thawing. When spring comes to the Continental Divide, the snow, bank, snow banks are broken in two, and half fall south and half fall north. It's the Gulf of Mexico or Hudson Bay, one or the other, for the snow, the dirt, the grass, the animals, and me. The Minnesota prairie has never heard of free will. <laughs> it asks you quietly at first to accept and even love your faith. You find out that if you fall south, life will be easy as warm rain. You wake up with an outgoing personality and a knack for business. <laughs> <laughs> the river carries you. You float easily and are a good swimmer. But if you fall north while daydreaming, you'll never quite get your footing back again. <laughs> You will spend most of your time looking toward yourself and see nothing but holes. There will be gaps in your memory, and you won't be able to earn a living. You always point north like a compass. You always have to travel on foot against the wind. You always think things might get better. You watch the geese and are sure you can fly. It's called Crickets in the Dark. <clears throat> One summer in South Dakota, uh, I would always have to find, I, I worked seasonally, so I'd have to find places to live every summer. So I got kicked out of the bunkhouse when the graduate students came because they had to do research. So I'd find a farm place, and one of the farm places I found was a 100-year-old house that had a sign saying that, and it was nobody living there, but the farmer that farmed it, farmed the land, kept cattle there, and he said, well, if you stay there, you can stay for nothing. And he, he had cattle, so he wanted someone to be around. So the cricket's in the dark. The farmhouse I'm staying in this year is 100 years old. Big, with six bedrooms upstairs and a walk-in mm -hmm. attic. A farmer's letting me live here for nothing. He thinks my presence will discourage cattle rustlers. Don't think they will bother you, bother if you're around. Don't, um, don't worry, he said. I don't. My shotgun is in the corner. <laughs> I sleep in the living room by the open bay windows. A bouquet of common ore and lilacs floats in from the 19th century. <laughs> I am so far out on the prairie that there are no lights except mine, the stars and the fireflies. When my lights are off, only the stars and the fireflies are left to show the earth which way to turn. Well in the darkness, the crickets leap into the deep, deep end of night singing. <coughs> I didn't have any trouble at all. I mean, very polite mess or something. <laughs> <laughs> it's called Life of a Day. And it was, uh, it was just recently <laughs> in, in Minnesota Volunteer Magazine. And um, Kathleen, the editor, was kind enough to use the poem. And it's, it's a prose poem also. Like people or dogs, each day is unique and has its own personality quirks which can easily be seen if you look closely. But there are so few days of, as compared to people, not to mention dogs, that it would be surprising if a day were not a hundred times more interesting than most people. <laughs> Usually they just pass, mostly unnoticed, unless they're wildly nice, <coughs> such as autumn ones filled full of red maple trees and hazy sunlight, or if they're grimly awful ones in a winter blizzard that kills the lost traveler and bunches of cattle. For some reason, we want to see days pass, even though most of us claim we don't care to reach our last one for a long time. We examine each day before us with barely a glance and say, no, this isn't the one I've been looking for, <laughs> and wait in a bored sort of way for the next, when we are convinced our lives will start for real. Meanwhile, this day is going by perfectly well adjusted, <laughs> as some days are, with the right amounts with sunlight and shade, and a light breeze perfumed from the mixture of fallen apples, corn stubble, dry oak leaves, and the faint odor of last night's meandering skunk. <laughs> <laughs> and this one I wasn't exactly going to read, but I think it well. It's about finding, uh, about writing, sort of. It's called Words in the Wild. Uh, words are not common outdoors. Do you know how long it takes to find a word among the brush 
Have a tall blue stem? You can look all morning, and the word you need will be miles away, <laughs> resting under a windmill in the sun. When you do catch the word, it is rare and alive. It does not want to be put into a, into a pen or tossed inside a poem made large as a house. It needs to be left with open spaces around it, trusted enough not to be staked down. And still, sometimes it runs off in the night. <laughs> um, this is called Out of Nothing. It's w the first uh, snow in winter. Well, the first snowflake, actually. Snow began slowly. Only one flake fell all morning. It was talked about by everyone as it gathered for class. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. <laughs> it brought back memories of other times. Dreams of ice skates, long shotguns waving at geese, cities lighting up somewhere off the horizon in a cold gray day. Only one snowflake, but it fell with the grace of a star out of the ragged air. It filled the day with a clarity seldom noticed. It stood out sharply as a telephone pole against the skyline of the winter we each keep to ourselves. Get a better system. <clears throat> this is called uh, uh, one of the. I'd, I'd cut gate poles for gates out of cottonwood or aspen, and we try to block off civilians from so they couldn't drive all over the wildlife areas. And it was kind of a. I always felt so superior because I could drive anywhere I wanted. <laughs> you know, so they can't trust these government guys, you know. <laughs> but we had all the freedom to do what we like. But anyway, it's called, uh, um, yeah, the ants, the feeble people. Those fall days are best when the afternoons warm up enough to take the edge off. And my ragged work jacket is too heavy, but I leave it on anyway. In the old gravel pit, I take a break from cutting wood. Aspen and cottonwood have grown up since the pit was abandoned. Some have become real trees and show their age with broken limbs and lightning scars. Under the sh shivering yellow leaves, there's a large ant mound with only a few big ants on it. They have sealed it against the coming winter and now make one last check for open holes. I cannot see how they will get, be able to get back in. I wonder if they have sacrificed themselves for the others. They are calm. When they stop to rest, the sunlight seems to give them pleasure. I sit beside them for a long time while we feel sorry for the ones safely inside. <laughs> <clears throat> this is called When Storms Come. When a great rainstorm comes out of the southwest, rolling dark over the grassland with crackling white thunderbolts that strike as close as your hair, then all the things made by humans become small, and all the things we have learned to take, uh, and all the things we have learned take up almost no room at all. Towns are perfectly still, farm buildings disappear among the rain shiny groves of trees. In the farmhouse we are quiet. In the barn doorway we don't move, thinking we won't be seen. While well, the earth rocks and the lightning seeks to touch, like a tap on the shoulder, its next partner for the dance. I've been almost hit by lightning several times, so that, and carrying a, a, back, a steel backpack a couple miles from shelter <laughs> we were the highest thing on the prairie. Mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of, it's a good experience. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the wild aspen leaves, October. Icy wind blows across the narrow river, a household of pale trees in the small dusk of early afternoon. If the sun were a tree, its leaves would be the shining color, and they would drop over the toes of my boots, ankle deep. When I step, it would be the sound of light breaking. And this is a, a corn picking uh, poem. It's, well, corn picking in the old days, when you, you'd pick the corn, it would still be on the, the cob and you'd put it in a, 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 a corn crib and let it dry. And now you just pick and shell at the same time. But this was a corn picking 1956, afternoon break. 
I need a heavy canvas jacket, riding a cold red tractor, air and ice cube on bare skin. Blue sky over the aspen bowl I drove through on the way back to the field. Throttle wide open, the empty wagon I pulled hitting all the bumps in the dirt road. In the high branches of the aspens, little explosions now and then sent leaves tumbling and spinning like coins tossed into the air. The two-row tractor-mounted corn picker was waiting at the end of the corn rows. The wagon behind it heaped so high with ears of corn their yellow could be seen a mile away. My father, who ran the picker, was already sitting on the ground, leaning back against the big rear wheel of the tractor. In that spot, out of the wind, we ate ham sandwiches and donuts and drank hot coffee from a clear mason jar wrapped in newspaper to keep it warm. The autumn day had spilled the color gold everywhere, aspen, corn stalks, ears of corn piled high, coffee mixed with fresh cream, the purr of my dog Boots, who was sharing our food. And, and when my father and I spoke, joking with the happy dog, we did not know it then, but even the words that we carelessly dropped were left to shine forever on the bottom of the clear, cold afternoon. <clears throat> this is another 1956 poem, and it, it's called uh, Outside Hay Pile, 1956. Dark summer nights lead into autumn, and the frost that floated about me. Cold air from the shadows float over me onto the sheepskin coat I wore that smelled of the, of the barn and tractor oil. On my back in the hay pile, I watched the Milky Way turning through the far off dark like a country road, stars billowing thick as clouds behind a pickup truck. Yeah, stars billowing thick as dust clouds behind a pickup truck. If someone were to ask where the road leads, who would dare answer? When the big dog pushed his head into my face, I held on to his fur with both hands to keep from falling into the sky. <clears throat> and well, Sue talked about the dogs. He had, you know, had, had a farm dog that wasn't any good for hunting, but he came with me anyway. But um, <laughs> I just wanted to mention one thing. With Theo is learning to be a gentleman, but it's he's getting there. So <laughs> next time he sees a. <laughs> okay, this is let's see, late in the season. This is a, a spring poem. Uh, at the soft place in a snowbank, warm to dripping by the sun, there is a smell of water on the western wind, the hint of glacier. A cottonwood tree warm by the same sun on the same day, my back against its rough bark, same west wind mild in my face, a piece of spring pierced me with love with this empty place, where a prairie creek runs under its cover of clear ice and the sound it makes, mysterious as a heartbeat new as a lamb. And this is about uh, a toad, a prairie toad, I guess, plain spade foot toad it's called. And, and about the turn of the, about 1900, roughly speaking, uh, was a wonderful book written by a woman who studied frogs and toads. Toads are smarter than frogs. Like all of us who are not good looking, we have to rely on their wits. <laughs> 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 we have any. Uh, a woman around the beginning of the last century who was in love with frogs wrote a wonderful book on frogs and toads. In it she says if you place a frog and a toad on a table, they will both hop. The toad will stop just at the table's edge, but the frog with its smooth skin and pretty eyes will leap with all its beauty out into nothingness. I tried it out on my kitchen table, <laughs> and it is true. <laughs> that may explain why toads live twice as long as frogs. <laughs> frogs are better at romance, though. A pair of spring peepers were once observed whispering sweet nothings for 34 hours. <laughs> Not by me. <laughs> the toad and I have not moved. <laughs> <laughs> this is a summer poem because I, I write so many winter and fall poems. So this is um, about, well, 
Well, there, there are loons in it, but it's not exactly all about that, but it's called June with loons. <laughs> Heat heavy as an overcoat by mid-morning, the scent of pine thick as mud. Two loons call loudly, close to shore. They sound deeply disturbed, which means everything is fine. <laughs> <laughs> the sky is a deep, pretty blue, that selfish young blue that will not let even one small cloud anywhere near it. <laughs> because of its beauty, we don't care. The lake, as usual, has taken its mood from the sky. Its color also, the blue that breaks hearts. Light falls out of the summer day onto the surface of the water, delicate and silent, perhaps as rain falls in a different world, or at the other window, the one we are not looking out of. <laughs> uh, this is called uh, What the Bees Found, a prose poem also. Sunshine dries the dew, the prairie springs thick green, soft in the ravines, low and lush in the new grain, tough and wild in the river bottom. Wind and sun move over it all in waves of fresh light. June is a month of ease on the prairie. Plants grow without pause. Every creek runs with fast water. All who live here were born rich. One at a time the sheep are led to pasture like fair weather clouds. Warm birds jump from twig to nest to ground. They sing their songs without flaw. Not a cue is missed. The notes carry out over the patches of wheat and flax where they come apart and fall. Quick showers on the new fields. Large bees drift sideways from flower to flower. The bumblebee has a round body, the color of candy, lovely enough to kiss. When I made that mistake, my <laughs> grandfather gave me a heaped bowl of raspberries with sugar and cream. And while I wept great tears, I ate them all. <laughs> <laughs> Older now, I noticed that the hours must pass, even as do pretty flowers. Left behind is a field with bits of time bending in the wind. Each one checked for nectar by a thoughtful bee that will dance a map in the air to remind me where a lost day can be found. Then I will feel, uh, then I will feel a sudden sting for neglecting the search for what is most sweet. <clears throat> uh, this is called Minnows 2. <clears throat> There's a Minnows 1 further back from <laughs> books in there. <clears throat> and I think I was catching, trying to catch Minnows in the first one, and I don't know if I, I don't think I could, but this one I did. <laughs> it seems nature has many clocks, all running at once, set to different times. Some are as big as Wyoming some the size of a nameless creek. If you listen closely, the minnows were black seconds ticking, and it's hard, but I caught one. In the palm of my hand, it jumped and tickled and nibbled my skin, so I was amused and a bit scared because I was sure that seconds must not be kept from ticking. And anyhow, it had already escaped back into the icy creek. The day was warm and thick as violets. I wondered if I should tell someone that I had been bitten by time, and it wasn't so bad. <laughs> uh, the last one I'm going to read is uh, well, Prairie Farmstead. Out on the great empty plains, the sky is the main thing, the center of life. It is what is above, all around. You are always trying to keep your balance, standing on the very tip of a mountain peak. In sunshine, five miles away, the dark clump of trees looks an inch wide and a pencil line high. When closer, the patch of woods are full of old cottonwoods that surround the farm buildings with a stockade of autumn color. Those that live inside the enclosure are safe for now. The wheat field is plowed, the corn still unpicked but dry. It's rustling in the breeze, adding more music to the air. Cows are in the pasture with its shallow creek but when night and cold approach, everyone returns with a purpose to the farmyard. The farmer with tractor lights on drives in road speed up the dirt trail into the yard. The lingering cows, now aware of the sudden dark, trot in single file up the deeply cut pasture path to the solid barn. The farmhouse lights have come on and throw warm yellow into the dark. 
those still outside with chores they must finish, know there is something they cannot name, a chill they feel not from the frost. Then the animals watch the humans closely. When the first call of the owl floats out of the cottonwoods, the night has begun. The sentry is in place until morning. All is well. Thank you.